my name is Marcy, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to today's event with Lawrence Ralph for discussion of his book, Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland in Chicago. The Friday Forum series takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Lawrence Ralph. Lawrence is the Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and Anthropology at Harvard University. His work has been published in numerous academic journals. His book, Renegade Dreams, explores the physical and psychological injury that is done to those who live surrounded by gang violence in the west side neighborhoods of Chicago. We are very pleased to have him joining us this afternoon. Now please join me in welcoming Lawrence Ralph. Thank you for that introduction. And I would like to thank the Harvard Bookstore for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to share my work. I would also like to thank my friends, colleagues, and some of my students who attended this talk. I uh, appreciate you and your support. Um, what I want to do today is read two excerpts from the book. One really gives a background of how I got into gang research in Chicago. I always say that I kind of backed into my research project in the sense that I was interested in the problems of crime and violence, but not necessarily in, in, in researching Chicago. Um, but during graduate school, I volunteered at a number of anti-violence uh, nonprofits. And people really encouraged me there to pursue those issues in Chicago. They would say, why go somewhere else when you can, you can study those problems here? Like We have plenty of issues that need to be tackled right here in Chicago. And so um, the way that I kind of came to my research is from the encouragement of uh, a, a supportive community. And uh, I want to give a little background on that. The second excerpt that I want to read from is an example of what I call a renegade dream. Um, so uh, this really became the crux of my, of my book, the idea of living through injury. And I want to give an example of exactly what that means. <coughs> so my book takes place in a low-income community on the west side of Chicago that I call Eastwood. And if I could distill my time in Eastwood down to one signal ethnographic scene that encapsulates the heart of my project, it would begin at an assembly on gang violence at a local high school in Chicago. There, Justin Cohn tilted in his wheelchair. He executed this delicate balancing act effortlessly while simultaneously craning his head to take in the audience behind him. His neck muscles began to bulge as he surveyed the teenagers. He was perched in the front row of a high school assembly on gang violence in Chicago. It was the winter of 2008. 27 public school students had been killed since September. This was an unprecedented number at the time, but little did Justin, or I for that matter, know that the bloodshed would only increase. The ignoble number of deaths in 2008 would be surpassed year after year after year. By the end of 2011, three years later, 260 would be dead. Justin had been to many such assemblies, but this time he encouraged me to come with him. There was something remarkable about these particular speakers he promised, something that a gang researcher just had to see for himself. I soon found out what Justin deemed extraordinary. The young men on stage looked like him. They too used to belong to a gang and had been disabled by a gunshot. Now they were on stage calling attention to their wounds. Watch this, Justin said, directing my attention to the stage. They're about to make folks really uncomfortable now. As my eyes focused on the stage, I saw that the disabled ex-gang members were holding plastic bags and medical tubing and outstretched arms, explaining in precise and graphic detail the daily realities of life in a wheelchair. The teenagers squirmed as they realized that the men were holding catheters and enema bottles. Justin gave me an I told you so look. The men on stage calmly segued from medical necessities to larger truths. Their bodies now bear witness to violence, violence that can and should be prevented. They say when you gang bang, when you drug deal, 
The outcomes are either death and jail. You never hear about the wheelchair, Tony, one of the disabled speakers said. I didn't know this was an option. And if you think about it, it's a little bit of both worlds. Because half my body's dead, literally. From the waist down, I can't feel it. I can't move it. I can't do anything with it. The other half's confined to this wheelchair. This is my prison for the choices I've made. After listening to members of the Crippled Footprint Collective, I began to see the novelty of what disabled ex-gang members were doing in Chicago. I started to realize that in Chicago, the disabled gang member emerges as a prominent figure, one who <coughs> highlights the sobering realities of coming of age in a poor community under a persistent cloud of violence. Anti-violence forums like the one I attended with Justin and others that I would help organize reveal aspects of the gang experience scarcely mentioned in ethnographic studies of street gangs. Contemporary scholarship fails to acknowledge that victims of gun violence are much more likely to be disabled than killed. Chicago is a prime example of this trend. Over the past 15 years, more than 8,000 people have been killed, while an estimated 36,000 have been debilitated. When I sat next to Justin at that high school assembly, I wasn't aware of these statistics, nor did I know that the former gang members on stage would inspire him to pursue a new career path. Soon after the talk, Justin proclaimed that he wanted to be an anti-violence activist. If the killings won't stop, he explained, then we're going to need more hands on deck. Justin already worked at a violence prevention agency called Safe Futures. But now he was motivated to learn the craft of public speaking. He wanted to tell his story to gang-affiliated youth in Chicago and eventually start a violence prevention agency of his own. After watching the Crippled Footprint Collective, he had a new mission. I've never been more certain about anything in my life, he said a few weeks after the assembly. That conversation came at the beginning of what would be three years of ethnographic fieldwork in Eastwood. I had come to Eastwood to study gang violence, but I soon realized that something else was important. Justin's disability was obvious because of his wheelchair, but in Eastwood, injury was everywhere. And injury took many different forms. There, people didn't merely speak of injury in terms of gunshot wounds. Long-term residents saw injury in the dilapidated houses that signaled a neighborhood in disrepair. Gang leaders saw injury in the uncontrollable young affiliates who, according to them, symbolized the gang in crisis. Disillusioned drug dealers saw injury in the tired eyes of their peers who imagined a future beyond selling heroin. Health workers saw injury in the diseases like HIV and the daily rigors of pain and pill management that the disease required. These pills, an HIV patient named Amy O'Neill told me, teach me that every day is a battle between life and death. As I spent more time with Eastwoodians like Amy, I, wit I, I witnessed how injury invaded people's lives. People in Eastwood interpreted injury on a vast spectrum. They forced me to stop thinking about this concept as an objective condition that a, di th that a doctor could identify and diagnose. Instead, I began to think of the myriad injuries that Eastwoodians described as encumbrances that followed them through life, that weighed them down, and affected their future prospects. Even further, I saw that injury wasn't just physical. I learned that community redevelopment projects of the local government, despite its good intentions, also injured Eastwoodians. So too did historical emotions like nostalgia, and even philosophical sentiments like authenticity. Over time, this range of injurious possibilities started to inform the ways that I thought about the, the diseases and disabilities and other kinds of physical harm like addiction that disproportionately impacted poor black communities like Eastwood. And I realized the limits of how scholars and experts have been talking about violence and injury, even when trying to help places like Eastwood. But what really struck me was this. Each time that I sat in a teenager's house and listened to him tell me about the pressures to seek retribution after a close friend was killed, or I heard former gang members recounting their stories of being gunned down and left for dead, 
I immediately noticed the evidence of injury, bodies that were partially immobilized, futures that seemed destined for pain and disappointment. Then I noticed the bulging necks and fierce eyes of Eastwoodians as they told me their stories, bodies that despite their injuries weren't slunk or broken, but upright and inspired, minds that weren't co-signed to a life of drudgery despite the terrible odds, but were busy planning for the future. Eastwoodians weren't afraid to dream for a better life, whether dreaming meant pursuing a new career path, imagining a different kind of gang, or both. In Eastwood, injury was intimately tied to dreaming. In Eastwood, injury endows dreams with a renegade quality. So the definition of a renegade dream that I work to uh, uncover in my book is um, I, I identify it as an aspiration rooted in the experience of injury that seeks to reimagine the possibilities within injury. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that again. For me, a renegade dream is an aspiration rooted in an experience of injury that seeks to reimagine the possibilities of injury. And what I mean is how those um, disabled ex-gay members were on stage trying to reimagine what injury and disability could mean for the community is one example. But now I want to turn to another example, and it has to do with the gang museum. So the gang that I do research with and collaborate with on Chicago's West Side has been around since the 1950s. And so by now there are different generations of gang members. And with those different generations come different ideas about what the gang means and the role the gang should play in the community. For the oldest generation, they like to think of the gang now as a kind of political organization that could potentially help the community. Over time, the gang has become known primarily for its drug distrib distribution network, and thus it's seen as a, primarily as a criminal organization. And so there's an effort, particularly by an older generation, to reclaim what the gang means and reclaim gang identity and turn it into a constructive force. One of the efforts was um, by one of the oldest gang members I did research with. Uh, he was a 74-year-old gang member named Mr. Otis. And his idea was to create a gang museum. And I should say that there were a number of, kind of gang members around his generational cohort. And when the gang members in their 50s and 60s and 70s and they still feel adamant about claiming affiliation, they're not just claiming affiliation, what they're doing is making an argument about what the real gang or what the real true gang should be and what it should do. And uh, the gang museum, the idea of a gang museum was a way to kind of document the, 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 the legacy uh, of the gang uh, the, as it has transformed over generations and decades. So the, expert, the excerpt I turn to now is from the postscript of the book, and it's called A Renegade Dream Come True. It didn't happen in the space above her jewelry shop, but it happened nonetheless. In the summer of 2012, Eastwoodians erected a gang museum. And that museum amassed a level of support that Mr. Otis and Tamara Anderson probably didn't think possible in the early days of planning three years prior. Little did they know that they weren't the only Eastwoodians with the unashamed dream of showcasing the Divine Knight's civil rights roots. In the end, Mr. Otis and other longtime members of the Divine Knights teamed up with a reputable local university and Chicago, Chicago's Museum of Contemporary Culture to reveal a past that was buried beneath the endless news report, reports that bemoaned gang violence. The Divine Knights gang exhibit was sobering compared to the sensationalism that accompanies so many cosmetic portrayals of urban life, but not merely because it strove to fulfill some sort of, some sort of positive image. It was sobering in its routine recollection of a past that should have never been forgotten. It was sobering in the same way that young Eastwoodians now describe a present that shouldn't be so. Like when you listen to a teenager chronicle her walk home from school, and in the midst of the conversation, you realize that for her, safety is provisional. Early death, the loss of limbs, 
the whole rotten ordeal could come as easily as a spell of rain or a bout of sunshine. There is a matter of fact timber to the way a young East Whittian depicts injury so much less glossy, so much more tangible than the footage of gang fights that circulate so often. One doesn't need much hyperbole in a description of violence, in other words, when just walking home requires a certain kind of vigilance in order to stay alive. And because of this, Mr. Otis and other divine knights who organized this exhibit didn't have to embellish either the gang's present day exploits, exploits or its peaceful history to show how much things have changed. In the striking portrayal of the gang's civic engagement, the pictures spoke for themselves. In the face of contemporary experiences of injury, the museum exhibit suggested an alternate pathway of what East Whittian streets could look like. It offered photographs of the recreation center and the small businesses that the Divine Knights established in the 1960s, when service to the gang had nothing to do with heroin, back when the gang members' duties were centered on the hard toil of writing, writing grants to governmental agencies. Four decades later, the exhibit that celebrated the gang's legacy of community service mirrored its method of fundraising. This exhibit attracted funders as varied and influential as an educational organization, the Illinois Arts Administration, the state legislature of Illinois, and even one of the largest funders of community-based programs in the U.S., the Public Humanities Consortium. The advertisements for the exhibit promoted it as a report to the public in which everyone was invited to learn about the history of the Divine Knights, to meet former members, and to listen to their stories. Consider the history and potential of gang members as community organizers, it beckoned. The evolving, multi-sided exhibit showcased cultural artifacts of the Divine Knights political past and the vacant lots that were usually served as meeting spots for feuding gang sets to carve out their territory. The exhibit also reclaimed the lots that now served as desolate bridges between boarded up graystone buildings in Eastwood. And in doing so, this community-based project enlivened isolated spaces with artifacts from a vibrant gang archive, especially when the curators installed Mr. Otis's precious photographs in the otherwise abandoned lots. In the photographs on display, I saw Mr. Otis's black utopia being realized at last, clean-shaven gang members in cardigans wielding long wooden brooms. They were sweeping the same cracked concrete that too many divine knights now pushed themselves over in wheelchairs. In the exhibit's images, members of the divine knights, past and present, were articulating a vision of their neighborhood that wasn't imposed on them by the local government. It was certainly true that, from the beginning, local politicians doubted the divine knights' intentions to transform themselves into a constructive community organization. It was also true that, as gang members in the 70s aligned themselves with the SCLC and the Black Panthers, some of those politicians feared that the vision of a revolutionary gang would come to fruition. With the gang's long political history in mind, the core question of this exhibit was as resonant as any I've ever heard in Eastwood. What would it take for today's gang members to bring peace to the neighborhood? One of the Divine Knight's oldest members dedicated 74 years on this earth to addressing that question. Finally, the cultural artifacts of the good old gang that he hold, held on to for so many years in his basement filled a collective purpose. When heroin took over, Mr. Otis continued to talk about the gang's political contributions, even though no one would listen. He never shied away or felt ashamed of his history, even during the heyday of the drug trade in the 1980s and the 1990s, when it seemed absurd, if not blasphemous, to talk about a constructive gang. It was for these reasons that he helped me resurrect a forgotten gang history, that he insisted on squabbling with pastors, with policemen, with credulous scholars like me, that when Justin called in February 2013 to tell me that Mr. Otis had passed away, I wasn't stricken with grief. In fact, thinking about those late night conversations with Mr. Otis, watching gang members from his stoop in the haze of the blue light, I couldn't help but smile. As Justin told me about the big memorial service that neighbors had planned, 
I finally realized that the image of the gang that Mr. Otis hoped to change wasn't some sort of nightmarish apparition. Every gang member that floated in the street, so many ghosts of the gang's political past, carried a glow that Mr. Otis could see, and he cherished that elusive light. He continued to see it even when most were convinced that it had, not, had been extinguished or believed that such a light never existed in the first place. Inside of each member, each battered, injured, surprisingly resilient young poor black resident, he saw his renegade dream. I was just glad that towards the end of his life, he had a breath left to make at least one of his dreams come true. Thank you. I'll take questions from the audience. Yeah. I'll start. Hey. Thank you very much, Lawrence. You're a very gentle person. I know that now. And here you are in this world of violence with a lot of reflection built into it that you bring out very nicely in the passages you've read. How did you negotiate your own personality in that environment? Thanks. Um, I've been told to re try to repeat the question. So um, this question is about how I negotiated my personality, which is very kind of subdued. And, I said gentle. And, and gentle um, to, um, to deal with the, a gang environment. And I think that it's a question of anthropology and of anthropologists more generally. Um, I, I, I tell my students when I teach a methods class that you know, your personality is key to how you think about going about doing research. And um, I know some people who have very gregarious, gregarious personalities, and um, they, they always have a million questions, and they always assert themselves in the conversation. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily help you, depending on the context. And, and, de and it definitely wouldn't have helped in, in the context uh, that I did research. Part of it is because there's been a lot of research on Chicago, inner city Chicago, and Chicago gangs. So the notion of a researcher is very familiar to people. And so the assertion that one would come in and uh, just laminate ex expertise into the situation is one that is very, um, very, there's a lot of backlash against that notion. So I think. My personality helped me in that regard in the sense that uh, I did a lot of listening as a part of the ethnographic practice and a lot of observation. And I took time before I, I sat people down for structured interviews. Uh, I waited till they got to know me, to got, they got a sense of my personality and got a sense of ultimately uh, the, the things that I was interested in. And I think that helped immensely with the project. Did you have to perfect a thousand yard stare? <laughs> uh, no, not quite. I mean, I think there was a big difference when I, uh, I will say there was a big difference when I moved into the community, right, and, and versus when I was commuting to the community during the kind of preliminary research phase. And I think that uh, when I moved into the, to the community, I got to meet people in a variety of settings, right, so block club meetings as a neighbor um, in the juvenile <coughs> detention center, in local churches. And so I, I saw people in a variety of contexts. And so I think that, that also helped with it. Hey, Art. Medical anthropology is filled with lots of studies of uh, disabled people, including uh, you know, people who are paraplegic, quadriplegic. And the uh, gist of those studies, one had to sum it up in a sense, is not necessarily about resilience. It's often about. Um, giving up or giving up, it's about uh, anger, it's about um, sadness. Um, and the theories that were, have been used um, to deal with the disabled tended to reflect that. They have been theories of uh, structural violence or, or some of Bordurian theories, or uh, Foucauldian theories. Now, so, A, how do you, dis how do you account for the fact that um, you're seeing such a, a resilient 
positive response to devastating injury? And B, um, what kind of theory did you use? What kind of theories did you use to make sense of that? All right, so uh, the question was about kind of the scholarship on disability and their approach to, to seeing disability and what resilience does to those approaches and also what kind of theories that I, I used, right? Um, and so I'll say first that I did, I did draw a lot from, from those theories that, uh, in, in, the, in the kind of grand scheme of things, talk about the kind of large scale social forces that constrict one's life chances and disability is kind of part of those scenarios. So what makes a particular group more successful, susceptible to disabilities because they are living in a particular community, right, um, than, than another group per se. Uh, but the way that, that I encountered disability wasn't merely that um, social forces were bearing down on people, but that uh, people were trying to make sense of that and people were trying to, um, to reframe what injury and disability even meant for them. Right? And I think it's part of the wider context in which uh, there's a way in which there are a variety of injuries. And so disability is just one amongst a host of things that could possibly happen to one. And so the, the question is, how do you make sense of those kind of a conflation of those injuries and the almost expectation of it? Uh, in a sense, right? And so I think part of the difference um, within this the group that I work with is that injury, the, the threat of injury was always a, a possibility, right? And so people were, knew that if it happened, they would have to reimagine it, or they knew people were injured in different ways before. So it wasn't, that there wasn't a kind of a, priv a privilege to be surprised that you are encountered with the life-threatening situation. Um, but I also think part of the scenario is that um, these disability meant something different to this particular population, mostly young black men, um, because they had been disabled in different ways than is critically accounted for, right? And so, uh, you know, in the U.S., the, the majority of people who get disabled in our wheelchairs uh, have it because of car crashes, right? And so the idea that this is just something that, that happened, it was an accident, uh, really maps on to the kind of disability that, that you acquire, right? But when disability is um, part of a pervasive problem, such as gun violence, um, there's a kind of another sense of urgency um, that, that amounted to kind of try to figure out, like, what can we do about this problem of gun violence then? And how can I use my disability to to bring awareness to to that that aspect? And so that's what I'm trying to bring forth. And so um, it's not that I think the the theories that have come before are wrong, but I think that this just adds a, another dimension to it um, based on a particular ethnographic context. Uh, Larry. Hi. Yeah. yeah uh, thank you so much for for this reading and for a marvelous marvelous book. I wonder if. Uh, which makes us think, I think, through a different set of lenses about what is going on in um, uh, low-income, high-crime black communities in America. But I wonder if I could press you in this moment to s put your own work and perspectives a little bit more into direct dialogue with some of the other work uh, that speaks to those communities and what are presumed uh, dynamics there. For example, could you talk a bit about how your own work uh, illuminates, changes, casts in a different way how we think about notions of, say, social isolation uh, in low-income communities, especially low-income communities driven by gang violence. Or uh, with other sets of um, uh, ethnographic work on urban communities where uh, part of what I really admire about your work here is that you kind of escape uh, or completely eschew and almost refuse to engage in some of the simplistic strategies that other highly influential works employ. Like by the time I'm finished with Renegade Dreams, um, I don't think there are two types of people, street or decent, right? Yeah. Or clean or dirty, 
but this is very au courant uh, in a lot of tales growing out of ethnographic work about communities like Southside Chicago. So I wonder if you could put yourself in more direct dialogue with those strategies of understanding uh, what's going on in communities like the ones you study. All right, thank you for the question. So, so the question is, how do I put my work in dialogue with particular ways that, and particularly at the present moment, that um, the U.S. inner city is being constructed, um, and particularly some of the um, key concepts that Larry mentioned was one, this idea of social isolation, that these communities are isolated and removed from the rest of society, and the other is that um, there are different kind of elements in, in, in the inner city and in that um, certain elements are uh, criminalized in a, in a particular way, that they're street, that they have a different kind of set of cultural values, but there are other distinct hardworking um, elements in, within the community that are, compo that are opposed to each other, right? And so I'll start with the first concept. Um, what I really wanted to do and think through isolation was, was, was to kind of think about all the intersections within, that I encountered right, during, during the, the context of my research. And when you think about criminalized populations and mass incarceration, um, there is a way in which you know, it's, it's intimately tied to the, to the wider society. And when you think about just the number of resources that are going into the community to contain um, threatening groups and contain gangs and contain these populations. So it's not that they are just remote from a particular um, idea of American society, but they are helping to constitute that idea of American society through the way that particularly police enforcement um, is undertaken in, in underserved communities, right? And so what I wanted to talk about was how the pushback against those ideas um, from the people I collaborated with themselves and how they were trying to develop strategies um, to curb street, street violence, for example. And the assembly I talked about is one example when people are taking on their kind of own initi initiatives and own imperatives and not kind of waiting for uh, a program to come in and to fix their community for them, right? And so that's one of the ways I deal with a, a concept in, such as isolation is so that the, the interconnections uh, within the inner city and how they're intimately related and culturally but also structurally, right, to just the sheer amount of uh, technologies and techniques of surveillance and policing that, that, that are um, in the inner city right now. Um, the second way is this idea of the fact that there are different elements, right, uh, within the gang culture, a bad element and a so-called good element, right? And almost from day one, that idea was debunked for me. Uh, even as I, uh, I, I told people that I was doing gang research, and, and so there, there are issues in which the gang plays central um, to, community, to community issues, and redevelopment is one of those issues. And so even though I was you know, on a, talking to people on a daily basis who self-identified as gang members, they would be in kind of larger, wider community forums in which they were talking about the threat of displacement. They were talking about how particular homes on their street have been classified as dilapidated and what that meant uh, for the community if those homes were taken over by the, the local government, the city government, and people were really worried about this issue. And so um, some of the self-identified gang members uh, were kind enough to, to allow me to uh, sit in on wider community forums where this issue was taking place. And when I would talk to other community members about, about these particular issues, um, I would say that, you know, I'm here doing research on gang violence, and I was interested in the way that the gang is involved in this community issue. And people would say, well, this is a community issue. When, when this person is here, they're not a gang member. They're, they're my grandson. They're my nephew. They're my niece. And so there's another set of relations that often overlap and contradict 
a kind of neat dichotomy between what is a good element and what is a, a bad element in, in the neighborhood. And people were highly aware and attuned to the fact uh, that a discourse of a kind of threatening, dangerous gang was being precisely used to justify why the neighborhood um, should be redeveloped, why there needed to be new people to come in and um, take over the neighborhood. And so there was a lot of pushback against that, that idea. And so that's one of the things I try to incorporate in my research.